You never really know a person, do you? For more than 30 years, Dennis Rader lived as a pillar of the community he was secretly terrorizing. He was a Cub Scout leader who used the weekend camping trips as convenient alibis. He was trusted with the keys to his church, and he turned the basement into the scene of horrific crimes. He found potential victims while installing security systems for the ADT alarm company, and he raised a wife and two kids who thought he hung the moon. But they had never met his deadly alter ego, BTK. It was the name he gave himself, three letters that meant bind, torture, kill his preferred method of murder. Now here's how he managed to hide in plain sight for decades. I'm Chris and welcome to True Crime Recaps. 31 years ago, BTK took his 10th victim. Today, Dennis Rader says he's a good guy who did some bad things. Now let me tell you about the bad things he did in Wichita, Kansas. It was January 15, 1974. Dennis had been stalking the Otero family for several weeks, ever since he laid eyes on Julie Otero working the assembly line at the Coleman plant in town. She was only there for a month before she got laid off, but that was enough time to catch his attention. And when he saw her 11-year-old daughter, Josephine, he knew they were the ones he wanted to start with. Up to then, he'd only fantasized about taking victims. He called this deadly alter ego Factor X, or Rex for short. It was a secret addiction to terror and pain that he had for as long as he could remember. When a psychologist from the A&E docuseries, BTK Confession of a Serial Killer, asked him to name the moment he became aware of these cravings, he told her a story. When he was just a kid, maybe five, maybe younger, his mother was cleaning and somehow she got her wedding ring stuck in the springs under the couch. She was trapped and starting to panic when she yelled for Dennis. The helpless, scared look on her face excited him. That's what he wanted from his victims, no matter if they were the neighbor's dogs and cats or the neighbors themselves. In his mind, they were nothing more than props to bring him pleasure. They weren't living, breathing people. They were projects. He called Julie and her daughter Project Little Mex. The family had moved to Kansas from New York City not long before they crossed paths with Dennis Rader. It was Julie, her husband Joseph Sr., and their five kids, 15-year-old Charlie, 14-year-old Danny, 13-year-old Carmen, 11-year-old Josephine, and 9-year-old Joey Jr. On that Tuesday morning in 1974, Dennis showed up at their back door carrying a briefcase filled with ropes, black tape, gloves, a knife, and a 22, his hit kit, as he affectionately called it. He had already cut the phone lines and was debating whether he should break in or knock when the door opened. Little Joey was letting the dog out, and Dennis saw his chance and forced his way in at gunpoint. It was 7.30 in the morning. He expected Joseph to be at work, but to his surprise, the man was still at home. At first, they thought it was a joke. When they realized it wasn't, they started to panic, but Dennis calmed them down by telling them he was just there to rob them. If they cooperated and let him tie them up, he promised he would just take their car and some food and go. He took them into the master bedroom and tied their hands and feet at gunpoint. Julie and Josephine were on the bed. Joseph and his youngest son were on the floor, but they weren't the silent, helpless victims he'd fantasized about. He considered waiting for another opportunity or moving on to another project. Things weren't evolving like he thought they would. But as he thought about it, he realized he wasn't wearing a mask and they could easily ID him if it came to it. That's when he made the decision to, in his words, put them down. But since this was his first time, he didn't know exactly how to do it or how long it might take. He put a plastic bag over Joseph's head and choked him until he passed out. Dennis thought he was dead. He did the same to Julie, but then, to his surprise, Joseph came too. When he turned to look at him, he realized that he had bitten through the plastic bag and he could breathe again. The next time he wrapped his hand around his throat, he delivered what he later called the death choke. He took the nine-year-old into another room and tied two t-shirts and a bag over his head. He pulled up a chair and watched him die. Then he turned his attention to his real target, Josephine. As a kid, most of his fantasies had played out in his parents' basement. He used to dress up in women's lingerie, put on a hood or a mask, and take Polaroids of himself posing as a victim down there. He took her down to the basement and reenacted his most vile fantasies. She was found bound and hanging down there. His semen was on her leg. DNA wasn't a concern for monsters like him back then. 
She hadn't been raped. That was one thing he refused to do to any woman. Somehow his warped sense of right and wrong led him to believe that rape was worse than murder. When he was finished, he picked up the house, stole Joseph's watch and Joey's radio, and drove away in the Otero's car. He left it at a nearby store, walked back to his car, and drove home. After school that afternoon, the three older Otero kids would come home to find their family destroyed. At the same time, in a suburb outside of Wichita called Park City, the Raider family was just beginning to grow. Three years earlier, he'd married a woman he also met at the Coleman plant, a conservative Christian woman named Paula. Only three months after the Oteros, he struck again, but he was careful to change it up just enough that the police wouldn't connect his next project to his first one. His target was yet another woman he knew from the Coleman plant, a 21-year-old named Catherine Bright. Codename, Project Lights Out. On April 4th, 1974, he knocked on Catherine's door. She didn't answer, so he walked around to the back and broke in. But this time, he didn't cut the phone cord. He hid near her bedroom with his 22, waiting for her to walk in. But when the door opened, she wasn't alone. Her 19-year-old brother Kevin was with her, so he used the same tactics he did with the Oteros. He told them he was a wanted man in California, and he wanted their car and some money. When they were tied up in separate rooms, he tried to strangle Kevin first, but he managed to break loose and he attacked. Dennis shot him in the head and went back to Catherine. But she had also loosened her bonds enough for her to fight back. And then, just as he thought he was about to overpower her, Kevin burst in and jumped him. Miraculously, the bullet didn't kill him. And Dennis shot him a second time and went back to finish Catherine. But, just like her brother, she wouldn't be so easy to kill. In the end, he had to use his knife on her instead of his hands. Then, Kevin managed to escape the house. Dennis cleaned up what he could and fled before the police got there. Six months later, according to Crime Magazine, a Wichita man was arrested for trying to have sex with a duck. As he was being questioned, he confessed to the Otero murders. He said he did it with two other men. Both of them confessed after they were arrested. Now, you might think this news would be a huge relief to Dennis. He had gotten away with murder. But for a violent narcissist like him, not getting credit was almost worse than getting caught. So he decided to do something about it. On October 22, 1974, an anonymous call was placed to the Wichita Eagle newspaper. The caller told them that the real murderer had left a letter in a mechanical engineering textbook in the Wichita Public Library. The letter was full of grammar and spelling errors. There were so many that the police wondered if the author was trying to convince them that English wasn't their first language. But they managed to make out the message. It said the three men in custody had nothing to do with the Oteros, as proof it included details of the crime scene that only the real killer would know, including the tokens he stole from them. The letter was signed like this. The code words for me will be, bind them, torture them, kill them. BTK. And with that, BTK seemed to vanish for three years. They hoped he was in jail or dead, but unfortunately, he was just busy. In early 1977, he was a father of a two-year-old little boy, active in his Lutheran church, installing security systems for the ATT alarm company, and taking college courses in criminal justice. He'd spent the last three years working on being a better predator, and he'd been adding more projects to his spreadsheet. By March 17th, he was ready to strike again. He knocked on Project Green's door, so named because the house was green and the woman he was stalking lived there. He knew her routine, and she should have been home that day, but something kept her away. No matter, he had other projects nearby. He knew the layout of the neighborhood well. He'd driven through it often, been through the back alleys, and peeped in the windows. But for some reason, on that Thursday, none of his projects were home. He was getting more and more keyed up. There would be no putting it off for another day. He took it as a good sign when he saw a little boy walking down the street. It meant there was a mother somewhere nearby. Five-year-old Steve was on his way back from the store. His mother, Shirley Vianne, was sick at home and sent him out for soup. On his way back, he crossed paths with one of the world's most notorious killers. Dennis pretended to be a detective. He showed him a picture of his own wife and son and asked if he recognized them. He just wanted to see what he would do, but Steve obviously didn't know who they were, and he told him so. He didn't know the man followed him home. Dennis knocked on the door and forced his way in. 
Two other small kids were in the living room with little Steve. Dennis started pulling the blinds and turning off the TV as their mother Shirley came out in her robe. He used his 357 Magnum to make her do as she was told. The three kids were corralled in the bathroom. He told her to throw some blankets and toys in with them to keep them quiet. Now Steve told CNN what happened next. He took a rope, tied one of the doors shut, the doorknob tied to the sink. He pushed a bed up against the other door, stripped my mother, taped her hands behind her back, a plastic bag over her head, and tied a rope around her neck. When I shouted to the man that I was going to untie the rope from underneath the sink, he told me if I did, he'd blow my effing head off. Steve stood on the bathtub to try and see what was happening. Now, that was a decision that would haunt him forever. His mother's last moments wormed their way into his brain and took away any hope he had for a happy future. He struck again on Thursday, December 8th, 1977. He parked three blocks away and knocked on the door of an empty house. His target, Nancy Fox, wasn't home, but that wasn't a surprise. He knew a lot about Nancy. He knew she was 25 and single. And that night, she'd been working at the counter of a Hellsburg Jewelers in Wichita until 9. He'd been there weeks ago to size her up, and he knew the house next to her in the duplex was vacant. He'd been outside watching. A lot. Watching and fantasizing. And tonight was the night. With two snips, he cut the phone wires. It didn't take a lot of effort to break a back window and get in. And not long after punching out at work, she found him waiting in her kitchen. 28 years later, he told a judge what happened next. Part of the rush was the terror, but it had to build and boil. It wouldn't do for her to know what was coming. Not quite yet. He said he needed to tie her up and have sex with her. She was a little upset, so they talked for a while and smoked. He dumped her purse out onto the coffee table and sifted through her things. Then she said, well, let's get this over with so I can go call the police. He said, okay. She asked permission to use the bathroom first. He told her she could, but she needed to leave her clothes in there. When she came out, he handcuffed her and laid her on the bed face down, used her nylons to bind her feet. His belt went around her neck until she passed out. When she came to, the cuffs around her wrist were replaced with nylons. It was important to him to remember what color he'd used, part of the fantasy. But almost 30 years later, that detail was gone. He remembered what happened next, though. He put a nylon stocking around her neck and pulled. Leaning down, he whispered one last thing into her ear. I'm BTK. I'm a bad dude. She was face down, so he had to imagine the look on her face. He left her nightgown with his semen next to her. Again, DNA wasn't a concern for monsters like him yet. He told the judge after the incident, I had time to quickly go through some of her stuff and I took some of her nicer clothes and slips and stockings, things of that nature, my tokens. It wasn't the first time he did it and it wouldn't be the last. At 8.20 the next morning, it was business as usual with one exception. On his way to work, he used a payphone to report Nancy's murder. Now there wasn't much to say, you will find a homicide at South Pershing, Nancy Fox. But they got his voice on tape. He knew they would. That was the thrill of it. Then he decided to up the ante. Less than two months later, at the end of January in 1978, he sent the Wichita Eagle a poem about Shirley Vian. But they didn't know what it was supposed to mean. They thought it was a Valentine's Day message, so they sent it to the classifieds where it lingered in someone's filing cabinet. Ten days later, Wichita's KAKE News got a letter of their own. And this time, there was no question about what it meant. The author straight up asked the question, how many people do I have to kill before I get my name in the paper or some national attention? The police hadn't connected all the murders yet, so he did it for them. And this time, it worked. The chief of police called a press conference to warn the city about the BTK Strangler. Just as he had hoped, the community was terrified. Then, he went silent again for another seven years. Unfortunately, he wasn't gone for good like the police had hoped. Now, right now, we have to give a quick thank you to today's sponsor, but please don't go away. We'll be right back with the rest of the story. There's no one-size-fits-all solution when it comes to hair care. A product that works wonders for curls might make straight hair limp and greasy. Or, in my case, I needed a product that added some shine and moisture without weighing my thin hair down. Thanks to my personalized pros routine, I can honestly say I have never been more in love with my hair. So here's how it works. First Pros starts by asking some unexpected things about you as a person. They want to know stuff like your zip code so they can assess your local water quality 
or how much water you drink so they can figure out if you're dehydrated. And those things can change your unique hair care. It's really cool. Your answers determine the ingredients that should be in your custom hair care routine. So my unique blend includes ingredients for like fiber repair, cuticle nutrition, heat shields. All their ingredients are sustainably sourced, ethically gathered, and cruelty-free. They're also the first custom beauty brand to go carbon neutral. It's amazing what a difference a custom routine can make. My hair feels stronger, healthier, and definitely softer. Pros is the healthy hair regimen with your name all over it. Take your free in-depth hair consultation and get 15% off your first order today. Go to pros.com slash true. That's P-R-O-S-E dot com slash true for your free in-depth hair consultation and 15% off. Now back to the show. By 1985, Dennis Rader had a second child at home, a daughter. So it was even harder for him to find time to stalk his victims and carry out his deadly fantasies. So he decided to take a risk and take someone close to home. Very close. 53-year-old Marine Hedge lived just six doors down from the Raider family. They used to wave to her in her garden when they were taking walks around the neighborhood. On April 27, 1985, he struck. Now, that wasn't just a random date. He was the leader of his son's Cub Scout troop, and they had a campout plan for that weekend. He figured the scouts would make the perfect cover to take Marine, or as he called her, Project Cookie, since she worked part-time in a local coffee shop. Before he left town, he stashed black plastic and thumbtacks in the basement of the church where he was a deacon. He had the keys and planned to take Maureen there. On that Saturday night, he snuck out of the campsite and went to Maureen's. She was out, enjoying a night of bingo and dinner. Unfortunately, her date didn't stay over. When he dropped her off shortly before midnight, BTK had already cut her phone line and was hiding in her bedroom closet. He attacked when she turned off the lights and got into bed. After strangling her to death, he wrapped her body in blankets and used her car to transport her to the church. The black plastic was tacked up over the windows to prevent anyone from getting curious about why the lights were on so late. In the basement, he dressed her up in clothes and shoes he brought with him and took Polaroids of her posed corpse. When he was done, he left her body in the woods and went back to the campsite. No one noticed he'd been gone. Five months later, on September 16th, 1986, he hit again. 28-year-old Vicki Waggerly enjoyed playing the piano. Dennis happened to hear the music when he was in the neighborhood on a job for ADT, and he'd been stalking her ever since. She was a married mom of two small kids, so he waited until her husband was gone before knocking on the door. This time, he disguised himself as a telephone repairman, complete with hard hat, ID, and clipboard. He pretended he needed to test her phone, and she let him in. But later, he would tell a judge that it was pretty clear that she was skeptical from the start. She followed him into the kitchen and told him her husband would be home for lunch soon. And that's when he pulled the gun and forced her into the bedroom. If she didn't cooperate, he told her he'd kill her two-year-old son, who was still in his high chair in the kitchen. But that was just a sick lie. He left her bound and strangled body underneath the bed. Her husband didn't even know she was there for almost an hour. He had come home not long after Dennis left and found the baby alone. The police didn't connect Vicky's death to the other victims, and her husband was their prime suspect for decades. Five years went by before the real killer struck one last time. In January 1991, Dennis was working as a Park City compliance officer, writing people up for code violations and managing animal control. He was a glorified dog catcher, but he milked what power he did have for all it was worth. He'd always wanted to be in law enforcement, so the uniform and badge he wore for work pleased him. He'd also reached a certain level of authority at church. He'd been appointed as the president of the congregation, which meant he was in charge of the board that made the decisions about the church and the money it brought in. And can you imagine? The man was a pillar of the community, but he wouldn't be able to stay away from the dark side for long. Dennis Rader's 10th and last victim was 62-year-old Dolores Davis. Late one night in January 1991, he threw a cinder block through her sliding door. She was quickly handcuffed and strangled with a pair of nylons. He took her body to a nearby lake and hid it under a bridge. The next night, he snuck away from another Cub Scout trip and returned to her body. He put a mask on her face and took Polaroids of her posed in the lingerie and shoes he brought with him. 
Her body was found two weeks later, but it wasn't connected to BTK. Compared to the Oteros and Nancy Fox and the other victims they knew about, this wasn't his M.O. As far as they knew, BTK was dead and gone and had been since the late 70s. Another 13 years went by, and the 30th anniversary of the Otero murders rolled around. And by this time, an entire city had basically forgotten about the BTK killer. Everyone had moved on. Even his own children were at an age where they were starting their own lives. So when the Wichita Eagle ran a piece on his crimes to commemorate the anniversary, he saw an opportunity to terrify the community again. He sent the paper a copy of Vicki Waggerly's driver's license and pictures of her body. For the first time, it was obvious that her husband didn't do it. But Dennis didn't stop there. Now that he had some notoriety back, he seemed determined to keep it. K-A-K-E-T-V got a word puzzle with hidden clues to his identity, very much like the infamous Zodiac Killer. His last name and street address were even hidden in the puzzle, although they didn't put that together until after his arrest. He also sent in an outline of his life story, which was mostly fake and empty of any incriminating details, of course, but it was complete with chapter headings, including one very chilling title, Will There Be More? In October 2004, he left them an envelope he labeled BTK Fieldgrams. Inside were pictures of females he had cut out of magazines. They were glued onto index cards and covered with sketches of ropes and other bindings. Over the next few months, he left cereal boxes around with more messages to the police. You get it? He left cereal boxes because he was a serial killer. One of those boxes contained Nancy Fox's driver's license and a doll with its arms tied behind its back and a hood over its head. Another one held a message from BTK asking if they could trace a computer floppy disk. Obviously, the only answer to such a dumb question from an elusive criminal was no. They wanted him to feel safe sending them a disc, so they put an ad in the paper saying, Rex, it will be okay. And he believed them. I need to give a quick thank you to today's sponsor, but don't go away. You don't want to miss the ingenious way they finally caught him. When I want to lose myself in a game, Best Fiends is the go-to. Truth be told, I also play when I'm like waiting in line at the store or I don't, in between meetings. Okay, as I'm saying this, I'm realizing that I actually play a lot. It is that hard to put down. I'm already on level 500. And there's just something so satisfying about meeting the goals and moving on to the next adventure. So what is it exactly? Okay, well, basically, it's a puzzle game that anyone can download and play, but it's so much more than just a puzzle solving thing. The game features a ton of characters to help you and all of them have their own unique backstories. So far, my favorite fiend is Terry the Tarantula. He's known for his sweet tooth, so you know, I can relate. And the more puzzles you solve, the more characters you can collect. Plus, they add new elements to the game all the time to keep you on your toes. The more levels you conquer, the more challenges they throw at you. And there are thousands of levels, so you will never get bored, no matter how often you find yourself playing. And you will find yourself playing often. Oh, and they offer a ton of fun events to give you the chance to win rewards in the game. I just did the Minutian Disco event, actually, and I won more spins, which meant I had to keep playing. I had to. Don't judge me. Try it for yourself and see what I mean. Download Best Fiends free today on the App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Now back to the show. In February 2005, he sent them a floppy disk. The only thing on it read, this is a test, but they managed to pull up metadata from a Microsoft Word document that had been deleted. And that gave them three names. Dennis, Christ Lutheran Church, and Park City Library. Google filled in the rest, and that's how they got to Dennis Rader. But they needed evidence before they could make an arrest. Luckily, they had carefully preserved the DNA he had left at the crime scenes in the 70s. A warrant gave them access to his daughter's DNA, which gave them the match they needed. He was arrested on February 25th, 2005, as he was on his way home for lunch with his wife. The first thing he had to say at the station was, Why did you lie? He genuinely didn't seem to understand why the police didn't want to keep playing this cat and mouse game with him. 
When they searched his house, they found what they thought were Polaroids of another victim. But in actuality, the person in the pictures was him. He was able to go so long between kills because he posed as his own victims. Once his wife caught him doing it and threatened to divorce him if she ever caught him again. In July 2005, she made good on that threat and got an emergency divorce. In August, he was sentenced to 10 consecutive life terms, and he matter-of-factly told the judge exactly what he had done to each of his victims. He seemed to enjoy sharing the details, but when it came time for him to make a statement, the victim's families walked out of the courtroom. The speech that followed was rambling and bizarre. He talked about some of the ways he and his family were similar to his victims. For example, he said he and Joseph Otero had both been in the Air Force, and his daughter also liked to play with dolls the way Josephine Otero had. He went on to congratulate the police for catching him. Then he started thanking the people around him for their work. He thanked his lawyer, the person who cut his hair, and the person who picked out his courtroom clothing. Then he read a Christian poem, recited a verse, and wrapped it up. If they hadn't caught him, he was fantasizing about upping the ante even more. He had his 11th victim picked out. He even knocked on her door, but was scared away by a construction crew in the area. Unfortunately, as of today, he's still alive and well and behind bars in Kansas. And that's your recap. Thank you for spending some time with us today. If you like getting all the crime in half the time, please subscribe, give this a like, and hit the bell so you never miss a story. Amy and I are here with new recaps every week, so until next time, take care.